it's a hell of a lot of work to arrange stuff like this. <laughs> and there's cluster fest outside. There's cluster fuck in here. And I can't even tell you what's going on in my brain right now. I cannot find the speech I wrote this morning. <laughs> We had trouble, we had some tech issues this morning. Some of the people are probably not going to get here in time for the reading order, which they may not have time to check on their emails. So we're going to just wing it. And all I can say is all those people out there paying $119 a day to be entertained and distracted, if they only knew what they were missing in here. I started a few years ago with, I got a San Francisco Individual Arts Commission grant, and I saw the community component part and dummy I thought I should put all the energy into the community part. So I came out with, with a book, which I do not have in my hand right now, <laughs> called Standing Strong, Fillmore in Japantown. And uh, that was Japanese Americans and African Americans that were facing displacement and gentrification in the Fillmore and Japantown in the Western edition. And a lot of people in don't, this town I think the Geary Expressway was always there. No. And uh, not only that, but redevelopment happened not only in San Francisco, it happened all over the country and tore the heart out of inner cities all over the country. SRO hotels, uh, family owned businesses, all those uh, you know, communities of color, gone. Anyway, I could go on forever, but then we'd run out of time and you wouldn't get a chance to read, so I'm going to shut up now. Uh, anyway, I'm going to I'm going to read the whole readers list first, and then I will stand up every now and then from the corner and announce the next several, so you can get in the front row here and be on deck, and then you'll come up um, to read. So I'm done blathering now. So Kim Shuck is up next, and then Avacha, and then Tony Alderondo and Tarita Mikkel, Rafael Jesus Gonzalez, James Cagney, Flo Oi Wong, and Muto, I'm going to come up again and read some poetry, uh, Elaine Ellison, Lorraine Bonner, and she is going to show her sculpture when she reads her slides. And Ben's going to help with that because I'm a technological idiot. Uh, then Celine Wallace's Three Minute Tribute to Rene Yanez, then Tomit Robert Simpson, Roji Oyama, Raluca Ioannid, Carol Chin Morales, Tony Robles, Kevin Madrigal, Susana Proverb Perez, Alan Harris, Julie Nicholson, Charlie Amor, Joanne DeLuna, Sridevi Ramanathan, Andre Lamont. Lamont Wilson, Tommy Avakoli Mecca, Sandra Wasili, Sandra Bass, Guy Biederman, Dan Brady, Tiny Gray Garcia, Dana Rod, and Tango Martin. And the last few people are coming from somewhere else, so I hope we, we, uh, they get here on time. So next up is Kim Shuck, our fabulous poet laureate. Hey y'all, a lot of the people I love are in this room. <laughs> some of them I never get to see <laughs> except in contexts like this. Um, some people are coming in late, I'm gonna end up having to leave, which I know is totally inexcusable, but there we are. Thank you, Shizue. Can everybody applaud for Shizue one more time? <laughs> These books are amazing, you work tirelessly, and I'm in a position to know what that looks like. Boundaries. It's dangerous to be a secret, 
Centuries of practicing translucency can render you fragile, inaudible. Changing political fashion regarding inclusion can trigger chameleon impulses, can redraw ancient boundaries darker than they ever were, even create new fences, or we can make real choices and can choose to see one another. Bilingual. Skin a treaty, stake it out flat for scraping, and it will barely cover the distance between disappointment in a country that made you childish promises and our beloved dead arranged end to end from the mystic river d'Archelet. As the winter goes by, it will go white and stiff, an inconvenient reminder of things not finished, but can be softened with random words in languages you don't speak, like honor tattoos you can buy from local artists. The hide can become a drumhead for bonding with young people in the nearby park, or shoe soles for walking a mile, walking a mile a vacation in someone else's reality. And you can tell that story for years to come, years that you can keep track of on a string of knots, an invented anthropology, while you whisper a word that you think means something about mystery or sacred, but really means keepsake. Thank you. Testing. Oh, yeah. I'm so honored to be here with all you beautiful writers and really grateful to be in this book. It is really a masterpiece. I mean, I've only read the first few poems and I'm in heaven. It's such an honor to be here with all of you and in this book. So let everybody know they need to have a copy. And I apologize because I am known to stay to po from poetry readings from the very beginning to the very last word, but I can't because our poetry series, La Palabra Musical, The Music of the Word, is happening today. So myself and Mijo Tony, that you're going to hear in just a second, are both at that reading, so we're heading out the door. But when I see you again, please sign my book and come and visit us at our poetry series the fourth Saturday every month, Cesar Chavez Library in Oakland. And with that, I wrote this poem on that day of mourning. I knew that I was a paranoid old lady because uh, that this could never happen, and I woke up on November 9th, you know what year, and it, my worst nightmare was true, so I wrote this to remind myself. It's called, I Know We Can. We have been here before. We have sang in the face of the Klan and danced with feet all bloody on the decks of slave ships and on the longest walk on freedom marches in jail cells and concentration camps. Oops, ghettos that we're supposed to call our home. We, we know this place. The concrete jungles, the reservations are cursed of and by the uncivilized who have forgotten the healing beauty of grass and trees and the gift of clean water to drink and have lost their ability to love. We are familiar with the senseless mayhem of perpetual war, the addictive lust power for power, the, the, the intoxication of bloodlust, and those who prefer and those who prefer the inhumane sacrifice of their souls as they try to steal ours, yes. We have been here before. We know the hanging tree, the, the rope, the rape of our bodies, our cultures, the theft of our songs and our children. We have swam through the slime of misogyny. We've been here. We know racism, greed, and stupidity have no conscience. And it is only a matter of time before the insatiable self-destruct, before they devour each other. And, and I say we've been here at all before, through this all before, you know? We can get through it all again. We just have to be careful, very, 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 very careful. The madness of this narcotic is contagious. We must not get drunk on the stench of this poison. We have too much work to do. We must turn this suicidal drug into fertilizer and let our tears fall down on deserts, glaciers, and jungles and run down the faces of good-hearted people everywhere. I cry, and 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 my Tears come down like a waterfall, an unending waterfall for the victims, all the victims of civilization. We have been here before, and together we can heal. I know we can. Can you say it? I know we can. I can't hear you. I know we can. Say it. 
I know we can. And one more time. I know we can. Thank you very much for your ears. Thank you, it is an honor to be here. Thank you. <clears throat> this one's titled, Latinos. Latinos! Latinos are the colors of the rainbow. I said the rainbow, yo. Latinos are blanquito, negrito, trigueñito, and afro. Afrolistic, realistic, simplistic, always mystic, always real, really real, sometimes too real, always told we love to steal. So some Latinos become angered, so angry and angered, some have become <laughs> endangered. Some Latinos or in have become endangered, or misinformed, uninformed, and uniformed into the penitentiary right into the next century. Some misinformed, uninformed, and uniformed into the war turned into Uncle Sam's whore. Latinos, I can't take it no more. I said the U.S. military. Well, we're first on the front lines, first to die, then we have to bury. Have you seen how many Latino soldiers are in your national cemetery? We are used in the U.S., abused in the U.S., confused in the U.S., and told we are less in the U.S. Come on, system, confess. We have been infected, rejected, corrected, and almost never, almost never elected, yet always selected to clean, 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 clean those pissed on urinals and shitty stalls. We are the Latina nannies that wipe the mielda out of El Presidente's grandchildren's drawers, then kiss his ass to cut his grass for a visa pass. Latinos! Latinos are runaway slaves, runaway slaves with eyes open wide and no place to hide. Latinos risk their lives, risk their lives to reach the U.S. and can't come inside. Latinos are young men and women who serve this country with pride. We're here, there, and everywhere. Tall, short, bald, and even Indio looking with long hair. Latinos! Latinos can become what we dream. Latinos can become what we dream if given a chance. Latinos are stars, sports stars, movie stars, and superstars like Celia Cruz. Latinos influence people around el mundo, like Orquesta de la Luz. Latinos are united farm workers, teachers, preachers, activists, poets, your sisters and brothers. From now until infinity, we are you and you are we. We'll forever be in this country. We're all many branches but one tree, straight, queer, and LGBT. We spell Latinos L-O-V-E. Latinos! Thank you. Wow, it's an honor to be here. Thanks so much, Shinsu. Oh my. The work, I know what kind of work this takes. And uh, my goodness, so let's get started. Just trying to decide which one 
and I think I'll do this. We are soldiers on the battlefield with life light in our eyes, said Sister Sonia. 1994, 23 years after volunteering at the Black Panther Party Free Health Clinic, the Tribune calls asking, how many guns did you have at the Black Panther Clinic? How many guns? Not how many services were provided? Not how many programs were implemented? Not how many doctors or healthcare workers volunteered? Not even why we care to put into practice such a program with so many hospitals in our community? No, didn't ask any of that. Wanted to know how many guns we had not what illnesses or diseases most affected our community or how often we provided diabetes or sickle, sickle cell test or what may have been my program at the time. I would have told her my interest in certain grains to regain genetic memory. But she was more interested in how many guns we had not who ran the clinic or what hours or days of the week we were open or who was our hero or she wrote to set about such a task that sustains our health needs today. No, the reporter didn't ask any of that. She wanted to know how many guns we had. Black men, women, late teens, 20-somethings, volunteered to become doctors, nurses, pharmacists, therapists, completed homework between seeing patients. Black volunteer staff physicians, Talbert Smalls and Eddie Newsom, tried to reverse curse of opioid addictions purposely placed in our neighborhood to weaken black power base, developed methadone programs to destroy heroin dependence. We took vital signs, did sickle cell and diabetes tests, provided prenatal care, kept patient records, organized charts, med rooms, pharmacies, gave better care than Kaiser dared, held life light in our eyes, Books are bullets, educationally armed, right to fight through walls that imprisoned us as violent, drug-infested, gun-carrying, sex-crazed jigaboos. Kwame Turi warned us. We must be politically prepared for what is coming. We have no choice. The revolution is coming whether we want it or not. It is coming whether we want it or not. How many guns did we have? We were soldiers on the battlefield with life light in our eyes. We are soldiers on the battlefield with life light in our eyes. Sorry, I have to use this handheld mic to introduce the next uh, poet, Rafael Jesus Gonzalez. And after him, James Cadney. With the permission of the Ohlone people of this land, A little sweet smoke in the tradition of the Nawa peoples, because speaking in public is a sacred act. I was born and raised right on the U.S.-Mexican border in the Juarez El Paso area. So consequently, I am heir to two muses who speak in two different tongues, so that all my work are discrete pieces in two tongues. Después del discurso. Una mujer me dijo que no fui cortés con la oposición, que fui duro y que no animé discusión. Tal vez, si fuera Cristo, pudiera decir, perdónales, que no saben lo que hacen. 
o la reina y disculparme por haber pisarle el pie a mi verdugo. Pero solamente si supiera que los verdugos fueran solamente míos. ¿Qué, corte, qué cortesía tengo el derecho a darles a los que quiebran los huesos y las almas de mis hermanos, mis hermanas, les niegan el pan, los libros, a los hambrientos, a los niños, la medicina, el sanar a los enfermos, techos a los desamparados, que estropean los mares, que destruyen los bosques y los desiertos, violan la tierra. Afabilidad en los labios de la furia justa es pecado y blasfemia, de la cual no seré culpable. After the lecture, and this is dedicated to Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. A woman said I was not polite to the opposition, that I was harsh and did not encourage discourse. Perhaps if I were Christ, I could say, forget them for they know not what they do or the queen, and apologize for stubbing my executioner's toes. But only if I knew the executioners were mine only. What courtesy have I to give to them who break the bones, the souls of my brothers, my sisters, deny bread, books to the hungry, the children, medicine, healing to the sick, roofs to the homeless, who spoil the oceans, they waste the forests and the deserts, violate the land. Affability on the lips of outrage is a sin and blasphemy I'll not be guilty of. was pretty amazing there. The slides that you see in the back are by a uh, Puerto Rican uh, musician, uh, singer-songwriter Chris Matos. Uh, his uh, native village of Utuado uh, in Puerto Rico was very hard hit by landslides in Hurricane Maria. Um, so um, I uh, don't have a list of all the, the, the uh, the artists in front of me, but you'll be seeing some um, pretty amazing art and um, I have um, a lot of people to thank uh, for that. I'm blanking out right now, so you'll see their names on screen. Uh, uh, and uh, you'll see their names on screen. I'm blanking out right now. I can't list them all uh, uh, because uh, <laughs> I'm having a, my mind is blanking out. But uh, uh, anyway, next up is uh, Flo Oi Wong, and then uh, no James Cagney. And then, uh, and then Flo Oi Wong, and then Ann Muto. Hey, everybody. Good afternoon. Thank you, Shu Zue, for, uh, for your work in this book. Blessings to you for this. Um, the poem I'm going to do is called Between a Rock and an Immigrant. This poem was written and it is dedicated to Jacqueline Call and it is modeled after a poem by Allen Ginsberg from 1956. America, God damn. This is what it's like being between Plymouth's rock wall and an immigrant. America, liberty and justice sure do make cute baby goat names. America, your wig is powdered with coke, but the lice don't seem to mind. America, I'm leaning in. I'm waiting for the conversation to turn to genocide so I can say, me too. America, wake up. You're missing the point. 
You invented terrorism, but only used dark-skinned models in its ad campaigns. You award assassins with Black Friday arms deals. America, when I say you, I mean we, the people, I guess. I plan to make extra cash, make trademarking, waterboarding, but it's patented already. Are there tortures you don't profit from? Which bank do you entrust your thoughts and prayers? America, can you say her name? As in a novena, not a marketing slogan. America, nine people were murdered in a church, but the shooter on your flatbed truck is still hungry. Eleven people were murdered in a synagogue, but they brought it on themselves for praying unarmed. Twenty children were shot at Sandy Hook, but your taste is for a loaded gun over a living child. If you say you love children, Emmett Till has four little girls he'd like to ask you about. Here I go, bringing up old shit again. America, you pass blood hand to hand, generation to generation. Has it ever occurred that you might be the savage, the terrorist, the outside threat you're so afraid of? Ask the Dakota Sioux their version of American history. Ask the buffalo about the endless pains. Ask the poisoned dead about the true meaning of thanksgiving. Don't act like you don't know what I'm talking about. You dropped the compassion units from all your mindfulness classes. America, what do we tell our children about this home of dead braves? What do we tell our children, period? America, you had a great idea once. You're a dry drunk. You throw a bomb, then hide your hand. You're the main suspect and loudest victim both. Stop, children. What's the sound of a mag light hitting a migrant skull? This is not set up for a bar joke. This is me wondering why people are still crossing deserts to escape slavery and oppression only to meet a walled promised land. In 1987, President Ronald Reagan demanded Soviet leader Gorbachev tear down this wall dividing East and West Berlin. After all these years, it never occurred to me that we kept those bricks in storage. America, you're a big foster home where the poor comes in for its abuse. It's possible that the people who've passed the naturalization test know more of American history than you do, and they still want to live here. America, kneeling was once viewed as a sign of respect or surrender, a sign of honor or a pledge. When a black man kneels, the gesture becomes threatening. America, there I go, there I go, there I go. America, can you just say her name, any name, insert a name here like voting someone off your island. America, this year my therapist recommended I get a facelift. I misheard her say race lift. America, every time a siren rings, a black man gets his wings, and his mother kneels at an open casket to sing the national anthem. What would it look like? Who would we be if we had no one left to hate or ban? Can you imagine this? with your eyes open. Thank you. Flo Oi Wang. Shiz, thank you for doing this. The poem that I'm about to read to you is in the book that I gave myself as a gift for turning 80 last October. <laughs> Read my lips. My mother was an illegal immigrant. And my poem 
is about my imagining what she went through when she was interrogated at the Angel Island Immigration Station. The Chinese that I'm going to use is the Cantonese fourth dialect. It's a disappearing dialect, so whatever I can muster up is helping to keep it alive. Yi, call me auntie. On Angel Island, near the open road, a distance from I Fao, San Francisco, the ocean billows. I think of you, my Gimson husband. Our daughters and I have traveled a long way to be with you. We are latched behind barbed wire. Soldiers with guns here. Second daughter shivers. She asks, what has she done wrong? What do I tell her? I worry. Will we answer the questions correctly? In Fakigua, America, I am your wife. I am your sister, not your wife. Shh, shh, I warn our daughters. Mogong, Mogong. Don't tell, don't tell, secret. Mo ham ngoi du mama. Do not call me mother. Gail ngoi call me auntie. Ann Muto, Poet Laureate of Cupertino, and then me. I'll be reading two short poems today. This first poem helped me to understand why my parents could not talk about their incarceration during World War II. <coughs> and how I was affected by their silence. Excuse me. <clears throat> A raw truth. Would my parents share something flawed, something ugly? How could they bequeath something shameful? They closed off parts of themselves to shield me from the ugliness they believed lay inside. They held their silence not to hurt nor diminish. They could only move forward by shutting out the past. I could not know their love lay beneath an avalanche of fear, the rubble of self-doubt. What I heard in their silence, I am ugly. I am something flawed. And in elementary school, I dropped the ko from my middle name, <clears throat> thinking that would make me acceptable. This poem is me claiming my birthright and accepting my little girl just as she was. It's called Tamiko. She is small, curly black hair tied with a bow. She stands still. Bluebird skirts and red vests sweep and swirl around her. She searches for the safety of warm brown eyes, honeyed skin, of knowing she is one of them. She yearns to hear, Chotto matte, gomen kudasai, sumimasen, arigato gozaimashita. She steps away, slips into a box which spins into space. In her box, she wonders, maybe the blonde ones know something she doesn't. Maybe she is the odd one, the out of sorts one. Maybe she should be more like them. Thank you.
So next up after me is Elaine Ellenson and then Lorraine Bonner. Uh, and then uh, we'll show uh, Celine Wallace's video. Um, I'm going to take, I'm going to read uh, a bit from a poem about my grandfather. Um, As the, war as the world exploded into war in 1941, peasants became pawns in the board games of bureaucrats. After an enemy sub shelled the central coast, the FBI took, took you, Jichan, my grandfather, in dead of night with no time to pack your clothes. Your crime, living while Japanese within five miles of the coast, you weren't even head of household, just a hired hand. But every uh, able-bodied Issei immigrant who did anything whatsoever alien in leadership, business, language, religion, martial arts, had been tracked since 1939 by Navy intelligence and the FBI. They combed business directories, church bulletins, community newspapers looking for names. Better to be safe than embarrassed. What bureaucrat wants trouble for a clerical slip? An 80-year-old vet of the Russo-Japanese War? Lock him up. A four-eyed mouse of a Japanese language teacher? Lock him up. The treasurer of the Buddhist church? Lock him up. Lock them all up. Since Lists of potentially dangerous grew. 400 men, 800 at most, the FBI and the Navy recommended. Take mostly men, leave women and children behind. Until the president had different ideas, other priorities, mushrooming, mushrooming, 2,000, 6,000, 120,000 imprisoned in American concentration camps, 129,000 dead in Hiroshima, 80,000 more in Nagasaki. How much is enough? And to all those folks out there, there are so many that just keep their heads down or think, Okay, we're not the visible targets right now. We'll just keep quiet, keep our heads down, stay out of trouble. I used to work with a lot of them. I, I spent my time in the corporate salt mines in the financial district, so. <laughs> this is to the people I used to work with. <laughs> Sheer luck. Swerving suavely through life, gyroscope spinning true, inner momentum never disrupted, Sliding along on greased wheels, quarters jingling in your pockets, winning every coin toss. You can afford to be flip. Blank eyes, milky innocence, a careless toss of flu smooth flowing hair. Some people are golden. Just lucky, I guess. There was a time when I worried that my young son would end up dead, drunk, or in jail. He had rocks in his brain, broken glass in his heart. The alphabet did flips across the page, and girls who didn't think Asian Americans date-worthy confided in him endlessly about their jut-jawed crushes. He gave me permission to read this, by the way. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the day the cops caught my son crouched behind a bush, smoking pot with his pudgy white friend, pockets loaded with pen knives and a sharpened screwdriver, they could have been sent to juvie on a conveyor belt to prison. But smoking while Asian and carrying weapons while wussy were not punishable offenses. They were the wrong class and wrong color for invo involuntary servitude. The cops just laughed and brought them home to their mamas. Just lucky, I guess. Like the time the highway patrol smiled when I said I was speeding towards my ex-in-law's latkes. Be 
because the engine on my new to me Mazda was so quiet I couldn't tell I'd, I'd edged over 80. Didn't even give me a ticket. Just lucky, I guess. Not like my black sister friend stopped for a broken taillight in her dream machine on Divisadero Street, a new to her BMW convertible, cherry red with a slightly frayed top. The cops didn't like her attitude, threw her upside the car, tossed her in jail, impounded her vehicle. To ransom it, I loaned her $400 she didn't have. She couldn't keep a job for long. She asked too many questions. Her gaze was too direct, her body too ripe. The last words she heard before she died were a joke about her black butt from a well-meaning white male who called himself a friend. He was proud that he got her to laugh and laugh and laugh. What else could she do? Just lucky, I guess. So next up is uh, Elaine Ellison and Lorraine Bonner. Thank you so much, Shizue, for including me and for this wonderful anthology. Um, it's quite an honor and very humbling to be here among all these wonderful poets. It's just amazing. This is a little different. It's an excerpt from an essay that I wrote, and I'm actually very happy to be reading it today because this is the 100th anniversary of the day that Congress passed the 19th Amendment. <laughs> I was riveted to the spectacular vision. All the Democratic women members of Congress gathered on the floor of the House dressed in white. Deb Haaland and Sharice Davids, the first Native American Congresswomen in the history of the country. Ilhan Omar and Rashida Tlaib, the first two Muslim women representatives. Doris Matsui, born behind barbed wire in the Poston Relocation Center during World War II when her parents and 120,000 other Japanese Americans were incarcerated. Today, we stand together wearing white in solidarity with the women of the suffrage movement who refused to take no for an answer, said Representative Brenda Lawrence of the Congressional Black Caucus. We will be seen. They brought with them a wealth of experience fighting for reproductive rights, voting rights, educational equity, and immigrant rights. They had battle scars from working against racial profiling by police, homophobia, sexual harassment, and gun violence. And we can presume that all of them had challenged sex discrimination many times over. As I watched them hugging, smiling, and taking their seats in the August chamber, it was hard to imagine that only a century ago, women did not even have the right to vote, much less run for office. I tried to put myself in the place of those courageous women in California who fought for suffrage, their radical imagination and their chutzpah that it must have taken to persuade men to mark the box for women's suffrage in the 1911 state ballot. But the rich diversity of today's Congresswomen reveals an even more compelling story. Initially, most of the leaders of the California suffrage movement, as in the national suffrage campaign, were wealthy white women. But many working class and women of color played key roles, roles that have been marginalized and often ignored in our history. Selena Solomons, an ardent activist from a San Francisco Jewish family that had fallen on hard times, bristled at the elitist society women who dominated suffrage organizations here. She opened the Votes for Women Club near Union Square, where she cooked and served lunch to shop girls, waitresses, and laundry workers, and then recruited them to walk precincts for the right to vote. Sarah Massey Overton, an African-American suffragist, founded the Interracial Suffrage Amendment League in San Jose in 1910. Tiel Leung was the first Chinese-American woman to vote in the United States Born in San Francisco's Chinatown in 1877, 
she ran away at the age of 12 to avoid being sent into a forced marriage to a minor in Montana, a common practice at the time. She joined the Presbyterian Mission, now Cameron House, where she braved vigilantes and trafficking rings to rescue Chinese girls trapped in brothels. Under the influence of advocates like Solomons and Overton and Leung, the suffrage movement became more welcoming to women of all backgrounds. Parlor meetings in wealthy private homes gave way to suffrage teas in community halls, which the organizers decorated with flowers to mask the smell of cigar, cigar smoke from the men's political meetings. Pro-suffrage pro messages not only adorned billboards and advertising on the ferries and streetcars, but the ingenious women organizers stamped them on paper bags at grocery stores, stenciled them on napkins at ice cream parlors, and even stuck them in pockets of clothing to be picked up from the tailor. The histories of these courageous women have been sidelined by the dominant narrative, yet the prescient voices now resonate in the halls of Congress, thanks to the women who carry on their legacy, who, to paraphrase Representative Lawrence, will be seen and will be heard. Thank you. switch videos see if this I'm works going to show you how to advance the slides he can show you what's I'll, I'll key stroke, or he can do the keystrokes yeah. and you can do the mic or hold on yes we'll, yeah. we'll get it can she use that mic or does yes the thank you i'm lorraine bonner and um i have the we're coordinating the slides with my poems so that's what's happening and i want to thank you shizui for putting this all together this is an amazing, I've been just amazed by both the artwork and also the wonderful things that people have been reading. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Okay, good. I have a hearing impairment, so I'm kind of sensitive to that. I have three poems, um, which are basically... Um, the next one, next one. Okay. Uh, which are basically about the past, the present, and the future. This is the first. It's called Multi-Hued Humanity. In the beginning was black, silent, and infinite. Light entered the dark, and together they created everything in time. In time, everything created us, a rainbow of browns, deep, deep dark umber to pale, rosy beige. Multi-hued humanity, multi-gendered, multi-abled, multi-tongued, children of balance. No one knows why a gang stepped out of the rainbow, tagged white all over every home and mine, beat down black, treated earth like dirt. We multi-hued struggled to find a name for them, the gang claiming white. How lonely they must be. They burn the ground as they walk away. the present. Thank you, Steve Jobs. The house has no roof. Mud fills every room, the walls stained with strange mold. The family walks in slowly, each mind gripped with some image of the storm, the moment of his or her unique and individual breaking. Far away, someone says, Look at that filthy house, what animals they are to live that way. Far away, they know nothing of storms. We have cell phone cameras now. Everyone can see the storm. Thank you, Steve Jobs, for making it harder to look away, for opening the multi-hued eye, bringing the footprint on the face close enough to count the nails. We are grateful for this new fine grain resolution. Far away, evidence is irrelevant. 
and this is the future. We are more than even we know. In the future, history teachers will also be grief counselors for children bewildered and sorrowful over us. Every part of, the, of our lives will grieve them. Gasoline, Coca-Cola, body cams. Only a few will study incarceration and only in small groups with the most compassionate mentors. Our calendar passes by the holidays they will celebrate, days when grace filled our trembling souls and we became their ancestors. We don't know yet how it will happen, the flowering, heart and mind, compassion and brilliance, courage and genius. The children beg to hear the thrilling stories again and again. Thank you, Benjamin. Uh, next we'll have uh, Celine Wallace's a, a clip, a clip uh, from uh, Celine Wallace's uh, video, uh, Renee Yanez. And then after that, a little bit out of sequence because they have to leave early. Uh, Tony Robles, uh, and uh, and then uh, Julie Nicholson, and then Roji, and then and then Tommy.
we're going to have a little bit of change in programming. Uh, Tony Robles is going to be reading next, and he'll be reading two pieces. Before he reads his own piece, he's going to be uh, reading a tribute to uh, another lost leader, um, uh, Jeff Adachi. Um, uh, and so he'll be reading from the Bayview uh, tribute to him. Uh, and then after Tony uh, will be uh, Thomas Robert Simpson and then Julie Nicholson. What was that you were saying about the technical issues to expect? Yes. Why We Love Jeff Adachi. This is an excerpt from the Bayview newspaper editorial by Dr. Willie and Mary Radcliffe. Tears flowed throughout San Francisco on Saturday, February 23rd, but especially in its darkest and poorest neighborhoods and encampments at the painful news that public defender Jeff Adachi, our champion, is gone. Jeff was the only official in this city that we could trust to fight for us. The black and brown and poor San Franciscans being bulldozed out by a city drunk on its wealth and power. Jeff Adachi was so determined to win the best possible outcome for his clients, not a one of them able to pay him, that he spent countless hours with them respecting their superior knowledge of their case and situation. San Francisco's jails are 57% black, yet blacks are down to about 3% of the population. Those, those were his clients, and he visited them in their jail cells and wherever they lived. Why do we love him? Primarily because he loved us. In a city where blacks were never welcome and always pressured to leave, Jeff Adachi knew he respected and fought fiercely for black people. He had a sense of kinship rooted in his family tales of the atrocity of World War II Japanese internment. He poured out his love and all the funds he could that he could find for our children, held annual backpack giveaways so they'd be eager to start the new school year. He held book fairs and science fairs to tempt their curiosity, even held proms for youngsters who couldn't afford one at school, outfitting them with formal clothes for free. As the only elected public defender in California and one of the few nationwide, Jeff was independent enough to fight for a budget equal to the district attorney's level in order to level the playing field for the poor. His staff was 40% people of color, 20% LGBTQ, and 50% female. Jeff believed that when police officers are clearly guilty, especially when they murder poor people, the DA should prosecute them. In May of 2018, he said, a hail of bullets is not appropriate police response to people suffering mental health crises. In both the Woods and Gongora killings, officers were not in immediate danger when they fired their weapons. The San Francisco District Attorney's decision not to prosecute any officer on any charge is mind-boggling and fails, and fails to hold police to the same laws we as citizens are expected to abide. I want to take a, uh, <clears throat> a moment to um, recognize two people, uh, the late Wade Woods, longtime activist of the Fillmore who recently passed away, and also uh, the late Philip Chavez, who 
was uh, an activist and a community uh, member who lived in Soma. He was a born and raised San Franciscan. I just found out he was a very close friend of us. I uh, just found that he, that he died two days ago in the Philippines. Uh, so it's in, um, that, uh, in their memory that I read this uh, short uh, excerpt of a short story from this wonderful book. And again, Shiz Shizwe, thank you so much for putting so much love into, uh, into these books and these projects. Uh, this is an excerpt from Bullhorn. I am a human being. <coughs> I am a man. Yet, I feel like a pathogen. I walk in the city, the city that gave birth to me and my mother and father, the city whose shadows cast over me, hiding my face, attempting to swallow me. I have a strange relationship with my city, upon whose streets I took my first steps. It slowly became disdainful as if the fact that I was born in it were a source of shame, something to be extricated. It sees me as a pathogen, something to be exercised from its streets, its public spaces, something that should be hosed down and put down the drain. But I still walk the streets, a five foot, nine inch, 185 pound pathogen. Why the hell should I leave? I'm from here. So here I am, a full-grown pathogen working as a housing rights advocate, carrying a bullhorn to the courthouse. A friend of mine is being evicted from her home of more than 30 years. Not quite a pathogen, but they are treating her like one. A near pathogen who never missed paying rent in 30 years, suddenly evicted because the new landlord wants to jack up the rent. Why am I carrying a bullhorn? Well, we had a rally for my friend the one being evicted, and I brought the bullhorn to break through the deafening silence of my town. The politicians must have jumbo marshmallows stuffed in their ears. The more the people cry out for housing justice, the less they are heard. It seems that anything that benefits the people is discounted, maligned, or plain ignored. But back to the bullhorn, I carry it like a cop carries a gun. For much of my life, my voice has been stuck in my throat, in a knot, trying to articulate thoughts and feelings in fits and starts. But with this bullhorn, I have found my voice. What do we want? Justice. What do we want? Justice. When do we want it? Now. On this day, the bullhorn decided to go AWOL. The thing didn't work. I bought new batteries and still the thing refused to work, refused to create a bigger voice and ensuing waves of rev revolution, undulating in the way a roll of toilet paper would do in a violent windstorm. So I had to speak with my own voice, no amplification, just solo. After stumbling, stuttering, and lisping my way through the injustice of evictions, chanting and more chanting, I entered the courthouse. So. To see the comedy, learn about the comedy of errors and everything that happened from that point onward, which was a downward spiral. <laughs> you're, gonna, you're just going to have to buy this book. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Robert Simpson. Thomas Robert Simpson, and then um, Julie Nicholson. Thank you very much. I, too, am very grateful to be a part of this auspicious occasion and a part of this book. I'm going to put my clock on three minutes so I'll know when my time is up. I will be reading from my piece, Little Jimmy. Me, my mommy, and my daddy gonna be moving soon. We got to, so they can fix up our neighborhood. My mommy says our block is gonna be the first one Urban Denewell fixes up. They gonna sell us a new house real cheap. Mama say, we finally gonna get to the promised land. The man came by and told me, my daddy, and my mommy all about what they're going to do. 
how they gonna tear down Miss Doris' house and Miss Franklin's house and uh, Miss Plusey's house, the Bass house, and they gonna tear down the house on the corner, and they gonna tear down the barber shop, and they gonna tear down the 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 cleaner place and the barbecue joint. Then they gonna put in some new streets and sidewalks. You know why they gonna put in those new streets and sidewalks? So when it rain, we ain't got to walk in the mud no more. And mama say, when they fix everything up, I'm gonna get my own room. And we gonna get a new kitchen and a new bathroom and everything is gonna work. And then they're going to make this brand new school for us to go to school in. And we're going to have new desks and new chairs. And none of the windows going to be broke. And they're going to make us a brand new playground to play on. And then he say, they're going to make this big street. This street gonna be so big that tree cars can go this away and tree cars can go that away. All at the same time. <laughs> you know why they gonna make that big street? So everybody's daddy can get home before they supper gets cold. <laughs> then they gonna make this big sidewalk up in the sky. This sidewalk gonna be so big that you can walk over all of those cars. But we got to move out of the neighborhood for a little while. Then I think they gave my mom and my daddy a whole lot of money for this house. Then I think we rich. My mama say we got to save some of it to buy our new house for when they finish. There's a man down the street who don't want to go. He say they should give him a whole lot more money for his house. Everybody say that man's crazy. And cause he's crazy, nobody listened to him. Thank you. Julie Nicholson, and after that, uh, Roji Oyama, and then Carol Chin Morales, and then Raluca Yuane. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Shiz. Okay, this is called Queen Bees, another neighborhood story. I wonder if she remembers me, the white girl, with dirty blonde hair among the many shades of mocha colored children in our Queen's neighborhood. Our favorite game is Queen Bee. In the three-foot gap between the edge of Cookie's garage and her neighbor's gray-slatted fence, hundreds of yellow and black honeybees shimmer through a veil of honeysuckle. They stagger around us, punch drunk on nectar like cowboys stumbling out of a saloon. They buzz cloud our ears, wondering about what kind of flowers these girls might be. Our friends tell us we're crazy. You're crazy. You're going to get yourselves stung. We invite them to play, but we get no recruits. It's just Cookie and me standing amid the honeysuckle like statues, one carved from ebony, one from marble, the sun dappling, then burnishing our skins. We synchronize our breaths. We hold forearms, weave a bridge for the delicate wings and tiny feet to crawl over us, tasting skin slick and salty. Neighbor kids sing song, be warned. Be careful, Cookie's mother says. You girls watch out, you're tempting fate. But no one stops us, and we just keep going. We get bold. 
we start catching bees in rinsed out peanut butter jars with holes pricked into the lids. The one who catches the largest bee is queen bee for the day. We're generous. Yours is bigger. No, yours. You're the queen. We keep the frantic bees in the jars only a minute. Their tiny yellow and black bodies slam up against the hot glass. Their smooth buzz now full of ragged rage until we release them back to their hives. Starting from preschool, Cookie and I play Queen Bee every summer. And then around my seventh birthday, the news comes from my parents. We are moving to Manhattan. My first question, can Cookie come with? And that's all the time I have. <laughs> the next th two minutes will be in the book. Thank you. Next is uh, Roji Oyama, and then Carol Chin Morales, and Veluka Iwani. Good afternoon, fellow writers, esteemed writers. What a great lineup. Very proud to be part of this group and have been since the beginning. Um, my story takes place in the current time in East Los Angeles, which at one time was home to most Japanese Americans in Southern California, and it has now become more Latinoized. And it's a story about a young elderly couple who, after release from camp, they returned to their home and thought they would find peace and tranquility in Los Angeles in the current time. But on this summer evening, you know, after watching the news and having ice in the neighborhood, raiding businesses, rounding people up. It gave them memories of what happened to them in 1942. So I'm going to read you a segment, a um, pretty good segment about this. And the title of the story is called Miguelito. After a quiet, hot summer night, A.G. had dropped his beer and he was starting dropping off. Emiko prodded him. Time to take out the garbage, A.G. It's really starting to smell. A.G. quietly obliged. He headed to the back door of the kitchen. He paused at the landing. He could see the beams of police helicopter searchlights in the distance. The muffled engines went silent as they disappeared over the horizon. He silently shook his head as he headed down the rickety steps toward the garbage shed. As he slid open the door to the shed, he saw the garbage can stir for a moment. Thinking one of the neighborhood cats had made its way inside, he slowly lifted off the lid and peered inside. He dropped the lid and jumped back in shock, his heart racing. He approached the can and peered inside a second time. A pair of eyes peered back at him. Por favor, señor, no llame la migra. Please, mister, do not call ice. His hands trembled as he raised his arm above his head in surrender. A.G. lowered the can slowly to its side. A young boy in tattered clothes emerged. Me llamo Miguel. Soy salvadoreño. Tengo siete años. My name is Miguel. I'm from El Salvador. I'm seven years old. A.G. cautiously looked down the street, back to the yard to make sure that nobody was around. He gestured. Miguel to be silent and follow him into the house. Who on earth were you talking to? Emiko, his wife, asked as she turned around. And who on earth is this boy? This is Miguel. He came from El Salvador. That is all I know. He looks hungry and needs a bath. Emiko smiled warmly and took it to clean him up. She prepared a plate of food for Miguel. Eiji. I saw lots of cuts and bruises on him, she remarked. I wonder how they got there. I also found this note with a picture in his pocket. A.G. read it. A moth flew right in front of him, but he was too dumbfounded to notice. It seems he left home with his little brother, Carlos. The note wishes them Godspeed for their journey. Emiko's eyes 
brim with tears. Miguel beamed as he gestured for more food. Emiko obliged and gave him a large second helping. His little hands reached over to hold Emiko's and Eiji's. Ustedes son tan amables y generosos. Que Dios los bendiga. You are both so kind and generous. May God bless you. As they looked at Miguel, they were dumbstruck by the new information about his missing little brother. I will go down to Murakami store tomorrow and ask Senor Gomez about where we can seek the right advice and not to get Miguelito arrested. There are good people who can help find out what happened to this little brother. Yes, we remember what happened to us and we must do unto others in this current situation. Thank you very much. And then Raluca after that. I am really thrilled to be here and to be inspired by all of your voices, both because of your excellent handling of the language and writing craft, but maybe even more your commitment to social justice and equality. Um, I'm really grateful to be included here. Also, I, I can't help but mention that I think all of us know that our president has vowed to round up millions of migrants and ICE has been directed to seek out 2,000 families across our country this week. My first poem is called NTA, Notice to Appear. A traumatized three-year-old dark-haired boy, a toddler, torn ruthlessly from his family, is asked to appear in a courtroom to testify at his own deportation hearing. Given a list of attorneys, though he cannot read, unaware of what a lawyer is or why he should need an advocate, not knowing what a legal proceeding is, what deportation is, not English speaking, unable to say in English, I need to go to the bathroom enters the dark wood-paneled courtroom alone, trembling, not looking up, a room bigger than his whole house in El Salvador, filled with strangers he has never seen before, directed to sit down by a gruff, foreign-sounding voice. Sit down. Siéntate. Climbs onto a tall wooden chair awkwardly, without help, his tiny feet dangling, looking up at the judge with wide, inquisitive eyes. Oversized earphones meant for adults are placed gently over his tiny head, as if the child will comprehend accurately if he hears the Spanish translation. The judge peers down over the side of his desk, asking his first question, do you have a lawyer? <laughs> Puzzled, the child moves his head slightly, looks around the room, eyes widening, lips trembling, legs continuing swinging, only faster, then suddenly bursts into tears. The judge, looking exasperated, trying to maintain decorum, sighs. 
adjusts his glasses, picks up his pen, and wonders if this is justice. His third child so far this morning. I forgot to tell you that I've been married to, uh, my partner was undocumented when we married for 31 years. Um, Cameron House was mentioned by um, another writer today. It's a Presbyterian um, community agency in Chinatown where I grew up, where I was born. Um, a murder happened there last year on the street. A homeless man, helpless, was murdered next to a historic community serving agency in Chinatown beneath a six foot cross. A cruel, violent act carried out viciously. Last Sunday morning, Aaron, a homeless man, our neighbor, lay prone on the ground in his spot on Joyce Alley, wrapped in his blood-soaked sleeping bag, while unaware churchgoers drove into the parking lot as usual, a few feet away. Lenora noticed. So disturbing and horrendous the mind reels helplessly. Rage gone awry, uncontrollable hostility, revenge brutally exacted, hallucinations, delusions, drugs, alcohol, all of the above, we may never know. Countless souls like Aaron wander the streets of San Francisco daily hoping for a single restful night without danger. In shadowy doorways, dimly lit sidewalks, under freeway overpasses, shivering in the cold all over the city alone. Aaron Kwong Tran was one of these. Our eyes have been opened. We will never be the same. The wound is raw and gaping. Thank you. Okay, we're going to have to keep it rolling along, so please um, dispense with preliminary remarks, just your name and the title of the piece. Um, next up is Raluca Iwanid, and then Ke Kevin Madrigal, and Susanna Praver Pede. Thank you, Shizue. <clears throat> As a nurse practitioner, a big part of helping people to find health and well being is to hold space for their stories and the immense journeys that they have traveled. As I listen to immigration stories that speak of fleeing peril, of dangerous migration paths, of family separation, and the unspeakable risks that people take to arrive here, I am reminded that few immigrants actually want to leave their country, their language, or their family. I know this too firsthand as an immigrant from Romania. Too often it is the political and economic pressures that make home no longer livable, make coming to this unwelcoming country a risk worth taking. The power and strength of people who traverse the planet to make their way to the United States into a life as new immigrants that often demands them to be invisible inspires me. I am humbled to bear witness to this power and strength and honored to accompany my patients in whatever ways I can. Reverence. Listen well. A man feels he is drowning in his own lungs, that it's hard to make it up the stairs to his second floor apartment. My stethoscope presses against his papery olive skin. I listen for the lung inflating, 
feel the press of his rib cage against my hand, the thrill and heave of his heart. His sounds stir tiny bones inside my ear. I wait for the snap of each valve, mitral, tricuspid, pulmonary, aortic. There, listening gives the answer, the whoosh of an aortic valve that won't open. Pay attention. Bodies won't tell their secrets to just anyone. A woman feels something in my head as though spirits are weighing her down. Slowly, slowly, her story emerges of carrying five children from a rural conjobal speaking mountain village of Guatemala across the bony spine of America into a life of being, feeling, imagining herself invisible. Listening and feeling, I find my way to the things that are told and those that don't want to be told. I peer with an ophthalmoscope, red light illuminating the eye of a young, strong man who doesn't believe in the diabetes that is slowly dismantling him, ravaging his kidneys, taking hold of his retina. Inside the creamy golden universe of his optic disc, I watch the pulsating maze of vessels. The vital force of us is strong and wild. From the first rush of blood through a baby's hummingbird heart to the final hiss of breath echoing through the cathedral of the ribs. We are both fragile and fierce, a miracle of nerves and synapses, bone and sinew, a universe of universes. Hey, my name is Kevin Madrigal, and this piece is called Today I Became Mexican Like My Father. When I was young, being Mexican meant accepting hugs and kisses from tios and tias that you never remembered meeting. They all remembered you, though. Being Mexican meant unconditional love for anyone you called family. But as I got older, my idea of being Mexican changed, especially growing up in America. Every time I eat out, I'm confronted with my identity. It doesn't matter what type of food. Chinese, Japanese, Indian, Italian, Danish, you name it. And at all of these restaurants, there are people in the kitchen that look like my tios and tias, shouting in Espanol, listening to mariachi music, and cooking. These same people who can't pronounce the names of the dishes they create are the ones whose job it is to suspend your disbelief. These cooks use the knowledge passed down to them to teleport you to another time and place the wood fire warmed kitchen of an old grandmother living in the countryside. And by some amazing feat, this time and place is completely foreign to them. Once upon a time, my father was one of those cooks. He worked at an American diner making comfort food favorites like cheeseburgers, steaks, mashed potatoes. He made people believe he was a little old grandmother, American grandmother named Delilah cooking from her family's handwritten recipes. <laughs> that, was, that was the only be beautiful part of it though. The hours were many, and the pay was little. But to put it in his words, conseguir trabajo en la cocina es buen trabajo cuando no conoces a nadie. Getting work in the kitchen is good when you don't know anyone. Hidden behind closed doors, he didn't have to know or speak with anyone to cook. It was a job appropriate for anyone and no one. And so he was rightfully upset when a Mexican like me, who grew up all in the same place, knew many people, and graduated from college, chose to follow in his footsteps and cook. I tried to justify what I was doing, told him that I wasn't only cooking, I was building a movement so that people like him wouldn't have to stay and work appropriate for no one for as long as he did, so that people like him could use it as a stepping stone, so that people like him wouldn't be judged unfairly based on their background. He never really understood, though. He cooked to survive. But today, my father walked through the doors of my Middle Eastern-inspired restaurant. He remarked at the beautiful space, made joyful comments about the pink-lit, glittery bathrooms. He sat down to eat our shakshuka, halloumi salad, and Greek yogurt with date molasses and turmeric granola. And for a moment, he believed he had been transported to a continent he had never imagined he could visit. There was an old Tunisian grandmother preparing his food. <laughs> Only 
it was people like him in the kitchen. People who face insane barriers in life. People who are working towards something better. He ate my food, and for the first time in what felt like forever, he began to glow with pride. He finally understood, and with his affirmation, today I became Mexican like my father. Susana Pravera Perez, and then um, Alan Harris, and Charlie Amor, and Joanne De Luna. Thank you, Suze. Um, I'm going to read two short poems from the book, amazing book. Um, this first one was written um, on the day of the climate march uh, in San Francisco last year, and it's called Just Breathe. A solo sub scrub jay perched on a wrinkled orange tree, calls out dawn like nails on a chalkboard. I can still remember mornings like symphonies and plump oranges on glossy green. Oakland wakes to a gray brew of pollution and soot, and my sister can't stop coughing. A wheeze planted its rusty roots in her once pink lungs. Pesticides drift, settle on a withered hibiscus. Birds fall, bees die. Monsanto, not my saint. Monsanto dances with the devil on a bed of crushed wings, dollars jingling in its pockets. I recycle, reuse, reduce, but what can I do to curb corporate cravings that shoot up towns and rainforests? greenhouse gases spurting from exit wounds. Who would imagine we'd take to the streets and march for air to breathe, for water to drink? Thousands strong, our chants rising like ravens, we march for a future for this sacred earth. We march in the too hot sun so sweet grass may always grow. We march lest we leave our children a fractured sphere, and to our grandchildren, nothing but prayers. Thank you. And this next very short piece is called, No, I'm Not the Maid, and Other Microaggressions. <laughs> like water off a duck's back, they say, but it isn't really. A seed of contempt is planted as they gesture with dismissive fingers, speak with their backs, say Puerto Rican with a curled lip. I read between the lines, an attitude slides off the page, rattles like a tremor shifting landscapes. A whirling hiss of disdain rises like a tornado, knocks me off my feet before I even realize it's time to run for shelter. Thank you. Uh, the photos in the background, uh, in addition to Chris Marto's photos of uh, uh, Puerto Rico, there are some photos from Charles Dixon, uh, who was uh, in St. Thomas, the Virgin Islands, working for FEMA um, right after Maria. And ironically, he was living on a cruise ship because the housing had been destroyed uh, with a whole bunch of professionals making exorbitant amounts of money going around from one crisis, international crisis, to the other all around the world. Um, so, but uh, here are some of her, his photos of some of the destruction in St. Uh, St. Thomas. Um, uh, next up is, uh, oh, and speaking of um, recycling, if you leave early, leave your name tag so I don't have to buy more. I have name tags so that you guys can hang out at the reception and talk to each other and other, you know, uh, the audience can talk to you. And also, please stay because uh, Leon's son, the photographer, is going to be uh, taking a group photo of all of us on the stairs so that we can uh, impress the funders. 
There, there is so much of this stuff that I really don't like doing, but it has to get done by somebody. So if anybody wants to help me, I'm taking interns. <laughs> anyway, so next up is uh, Alan Harris and then Charlie Amore, who was on the editorial committee and did a fantastic job. Thank you. Um, and uh, also thank you to Andre and Roji, who were also on the editorial committee. They spent hours reading. Uh, fantastic. I really appreciated their help. Uh, anyway, so <laughs> uh, Alan Harris is up next, and then uh, Charlie Amore, and then uh, Joanne DeLuna. Thank you. Uh, it's an honor to be included in this, uh, in this collection. Although unlike the rest of you, nothing that I write is meant to be taken seriously. <laughs> <coughs> I got the one fork, the one spoon, the one bowl, the one dish, the one glass, the one mug, the one pot, the one pan, the one chair, the one table, the one sock, the one shoe. That's all I need, just one of everything. <laughs> if everyone could be satisfied with just one of everything, there wouldn't be the tragically ridiculous imbalance of some people living in mansions with 1,500 rooms, some of which are never even occupied, while other people don't even have one room to live in. Is that really the way it's supposed to be? Is that really the way that God planned it? If so, terrible plan, God. Just awful. Start again. Worldwide minimalism, worldwide socialism, worldwide collectivism. First, gather up all of the material goods in the world and then divide them up evenly among the world's population. Then, give everyone an apartment that will provide them with just enough room to be comfortable so that if, for example, you're somewhat obese, then you would, be, then you would get a bigger place than someone who is thinner. And if you lose weight, then you would be moved into a smaller place. And if your weight fluctuates too much, well, then that would suggest a bigger problem that you should probably get checked out. Maybe you have an eating disorder, in which case you would probably be sent off to some sort of camp where that problem would be dealt with. Hmm, this is starting to sound a bit fascistic, isn't it? Maybe we should forget about that part and talk instead about how you very, very wealthy people probably think that this is going to impact you negatively. Well, you have a right to think that. This is going to fuck you up big time. You're going to go from living it up in a 1,500-room mansion to simply existing in a tiny bachelor apartment in a building that probably won't even have an elevator. But don't worry, while you'll be having to make do with a lot less, compensation will come in the form of the knowledge that there is a little girl somewhere who's going to go from living on the street without enough to eat to having a permanent roof over her head and a refrigerator stocked with healthy food. I mean, come on, how great will that be? Won't, that, won't you get an enormous, out of, uh, an enormous amount of satisfaction out of that? Don't you think that that will make up for the loss of those 1,500 rooms? Well, just give it a try. Look, this is going to happen whether you want it to or not, so you might as well make the best of it. And don't give us any shit. You don't want to end up at one of those camps where they send troublemakers, do you? Oh, crap. This is starting to sound fascistic again, isn't it? Damn, this is hard. Thank you. My piece is called Rage. Oh, sorry. My piece is called Rage. Driving home through Sycamore, the cyclist yelled nigger through your window. At home, you trembled in the, in the kitchen minutes before he walked through the door. You want to tell him. You need to tell him. Because you've come to understand that his rage is acceptable. Your rage will not be understood. Your rage will stay a string of beads from your larynx to your stomach. You let the beads show up at the entrance of your mouth. Feel them poke as you say, he called me a nigger. His swallow is a door closing, a dial tone mid-sentence. He rambles words like police, reporting, face recognition, practical words for a practical world. 
You wonder what that world would look like and gag at the absurdity. You're nine years old again. His words float around your glazed eyes. He can't see where you've gone. The only thing that travels back with you is his buzzing drone in your ear as you stand at the doorway of your neighbor, looking in, staying out. Another neighbor approaches and you move aside like a bystander. When he stops, you meet rage in his eyes, the rage that will follow you like a bad smell for the rest of your life. But you don't know this then. Instead, there's a feeling of ants inside your skin, inside your, blood, inside your bloodstream. In school, they called you names like driftwood and half cast. In school, they asked you to pick sides, asked you which side you most identified with, asked you to lessen yourself to be part of the divisions. But they were your peers, your own age. Could it, could it have been a shade of that rage? His gaze triggers the flight in you. You monkeys need to go back to where you came from. Onions sting, you burn. There's burning inside and your body gives water to soothe the shell, but the fire's within. Before you realize it, you're at your own front door, yelling into the walls to find a piece of yourself you lost so quickly before. Later in bed, the words dance in the dark and refuse to let you rest. The flame flickers and the wicker burns a little more. As you stand in the kitchen, brought back by his droning, it dawns on you that he will never know this burning. You turn and walk coolly to your room. Close the door, stick your fingers down your throat and quietly purge your rage. Thank you. Joanne DeLuna and then Sri Devi Ramanathan and Andre Lamont Wilson. Uh, in 2013, Ireland was trying to pass a bill that was nicknamed the Suicide Clause, and that clause would allow uh, women to get an abortion if they, they were at risk um, of committing suicide. And this poem is a compilation of articles, news articles, and of the National Rights of Individuals, which was written by James Wilson in, in 1790, which is used to support anti-abortion legislation, and also Sir Mix-a-Lot's uh, Baby Got Back. Suicide Clause. Back in America, the South Dakotans supported by the 8th U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals upheld, upheld a provision requiring physicians to notify women seeking abortions that abortion increases the risk of suicide. But what if you're already contemplating suicide? Down in Texas, the Christian politicians shot their rifles into the air, crying, victory for safer abortions, as the new law passed by Governor Rick Perry unnecessarily required abortion clinics uphold the same standards as hospital surgical centers. Victory! The clinics closed in mass. Women scurried like roaches down to the Mexican border town of Nuevo Progreso, which ironically translates in English to new progress, seeking miscarriage-inducing pills, $35 for a box of 28 Cytotec-branded pills. Some of them, said Lucy Felix, will wind up in the ER. My intent was not to close abortion clinics, State Senator Glenn Hagar said, but to increase the quality of care. Victory! The Texans made parents out of women who admitted they weren't emotionally nor financially ready to bring children into worlds, worlds without fathers, worlds filled with shame, guilt, ridicule, doubt, and embarrassment. Those pro-lifers sure seem like the kind of folk who get shit done. Now, if we could only rally them to lobby the government to provide free child care for the unborn children they rallied so hard outside of abortion clinics. Yeah, baby, when it comes to females, the U.S. Supreme Court ain't got nothing to do with my selection. Unwanted pregnancies, lack of financial stability, or rape, only if there's fetal endangerment. Back in Ireland, Janet Nye Shulban tweets her abortion. I cried from relief and sadness that the first time I had been pregnant, it wasn't a happy event. It was a time of stress and worry. Hashtag abortion, hashtag ow, hashtag sadness, hashtag heartbreaking, hashtag WTF, hashtag TMI, hashtag brave, hashtag wow. 
In Spain, the women protested by flicking thongs at the Pope and registering their bodies as intellectual property, thereby retaking the rights of their own bodies. An abortion performed without a woman's consent is consider, considered feticide. But what do you call a birth without a, the consent of a woman? They call that morality, a law, a right to life. But whose life? Certainly not a woman's. Human life, from the commencement to its close, is protected by the common law. From its commencement to its close. Life begins when the infant is able to stir in the womb. Life is protected not only from immediate destruction, but from every degree of actual violence and from every degree of danger. From its commencement to its close. But who protects the, women's, who, the women whose lives have yet to close? Thank you. Sri Devi Ramanathan, and then Andre Lamont Wilson, and Tommy Avicola, Avicoli Mecca. Okay, to fit the three minute time limit, I am reading the skinniest version of the essay that I am honored to have included in Civil Liberties. So thanks again, Shizui. How Goddess and Activism Got Together. I had never put the two together, goddess and activism. Each resided in its distinct realm. One was personal, the other public. One is intangible, and the other is corporeal. One is on the celestial plane, and the other is on the physical. Both, however, deeply touch my spirit. Goddesses have always been a presence in my life. They're normal to me. Goddesses are a vital and crucial part of Hinduism because they are Shakti, the divine feminine principle responsible for all creation. Women, by extension, are believed to also possess, possess Shakti, creative energy. So wouldn't it be reasonable to assume that goddesses and women are esteemed in Hindu societies? Why then are there more temples devoted to gods than goddesses today? Why is it that a book on Hindu deities will predictably dedicate a separate chapter to each god, but lump all the goddesses into one and usually at the end. The goddess doesn't seem to be appreciated as one would expect. Real life women don't fare too well either, not in my experience. Cultural norms subtly and blatantly preach that males are more valuable than females. According to social customs, I am expected to constrict myself and privilege males. Sexism ignited my feminist consciousness. Sexism motivates my activism. My mission in life is unequivocal. Work to create an equitable, equitable society for girls and women. Myths are synthetic constructions possibly based on truth, created to inform and influence society in specific ways. In the Hindu world, cultural perspectives and ethics have long been taught through the powerful medium of mythology. Mythology is inescapable as it is at the core of Hindu ritual, art, dance, and arguably life. As a women's spirituality scholar, I hypothesize that the divine feminine in mythology was deliberately switched from goddess almighty to good little wife in order to sway cultural attitudes toward the subjugation of women. I aim to empower girls and women by exposing stories and presenting interpretations that demonstrate the goddess asserting authority and self-agency in a range of personalities and situations. I offer my work as a catalyst for the reevaluation of modern day values, particularly around girls, women, and the feminine. I no longer separate goddess and activism in my mind. The two came together through my scholarly research. My goddess activism entails revitalizing the goddess where patriarchy has diminished her and in so doing, empowering girls and women. Jai Ma. Andre Lamont Wilson. Thank you. I'm going to read an excerpt of my essay, Quarry. 
The word quarry has two meanings. The first is an excavation or pit from which stone is obtained. This definition applies to several gravel pits that pockmark my neighborhood of Sun Valley, Los Angeles' dumping grounds. At least one played out pit, partially filled with groundwater, formed a pond, which locals called Quarry Lake. The second is one who is hunted or pursued, or any object of search, pursuit, or attack. This definition applies to me. Neighborhood rumors that I was gay pursued me for years before I came out. Some guys whispered, I don't want to sit next to him. Other guys begged, can I sleep over, please? Pariah by day, magnet by night, I reflect on an event in May 1984 as a confluence of two definitions of the word quarry. Ever since then, I've dug to unearth what happened when three white teenage boys with a BB gun approached a black gay man. The teens, for the purpose of this essay, I'll use their initials, M, A, and F, were my younger brother's friends. They had played hooky from school and come to my bedroom window asking for a drink of water. I noted M held his Christmas gift, a BB gun, and appeared to be the best shot of the three when they target practice on cans placed on a basketball court fence pole. I passed some cups of water through the torn screen. No longer boys, and not yet men, the three resembled beautiful monsters. I observed the way their faces transmogrified into those of inchoate adults, and the sneakers stomped the earth as if in a rush to own the world. Cigarette smoke billowed from their maws and drifted into my room. I turned on the fan to blow smoke back in their faces. Want to go fishing with us at Quarry Lake? Em asked. Bare chested, I rolled my tongue around my cheek. A necklace of the mask of Benin rested above my nipples. The face of Queen Mother Edia looked serenely at the boys. The stone excavation, meaning of the word quarry, comes from the vulgar Latin word quadreria, a place where stones are squared. While no one else squared stones at our gravel pit, I tried squaring the stone of M's invitation, which didn't add up to six sides. The trio hid something from me. They always called me fag and gay, and I rebuffed the sexual advances of two. Now they got a gun and invited, and invited me fishing with a gun. And if you want to hear what else happened next, you have to buy and read this book. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Avi Kuli Mecca, and then Sandra Wasili, Sandra Bass, and Guy Biederman. I was approached um, a while ago by some folks who, um, within, the gay, within the queer community, who are organizing to get the police out of pride. And um, I was asked to make a statement of support for that, of, which of course I support, but, and this, this was my statement. To those in blue, you think you can walk into our neighborhood set up a little card table, hang a banner, shine your shoes and buttons, press your uniforms, paste on a smile, and all is forgiven. You think we don't remember the decades you smashed windows and heads, spilt blood on the sidewalks, it's still there. The rain, 
the amnesia of a community desperate to be accepted can't wash it away. The man one of you murdered still roams the streets. Death couldn't take him away. Justice wasn't blind. It was strung out on Twinkies. Don't you hear the cries of those entrapped by your vicious vice squads that sought us out in cruising areas, rest stops? The men carted out in bar raids who lost their jobs, families, apartments when their names were published in the newspapers because you didn't get your payoffs. You feel no shame about the informants you sent into our meetings. You spied on us as if we were criminals because we dared to take to the streets. Now you put up a good front, recruiting from the community, marching in pride parades, you expect me to believe you've changed? I don't. I've seen the reports, especially from queer and trans people of color. And what about the murder of black and brown people? The abuse of the homeless, the poor? You want me to welcome you into the community? I'd rather welcome the devil himself. Thank you. Sandra Wasili, Sandra Bass, Guy Biederman, Dan Brady. The Haunting. This is dedicated to my Yupik family in Western Alaska in memory of sisters by marriage who died by violence. The Haunting. The women are leaving the village. They are leaving trauma. Trauma of ruptured tradition the old ways simmer while children attend schools taught by strangers, women work the local wage jobs, elders lament loss of language, the dance, the hunt. Modern demands, new ways overcome, minimize tradition. Trauma of economic change, gap between TV reality and reality village. Hunters imprisoned in villages made stationary. Animals managed for sport, for cash. Diminished food for the village table. Husbands go away for wage jobs instead of hunting. Not all go or change. Trauma of personal despair. Chaos erupts when the mail plane lands heavy with freight. The village on fire with alcohol-fueled anger. Something inside people dies. Elders berate the youth. Youth strike out at each other or give in, give up. Husbands jealous of wives working, wives worried about children losing their way to despair. Some sometimes hit, rape, shoot, kill, sometimes kill themselves. So the women are leaving the village. The old ways no longer work there. The young thirst for new ways. I left long ago. They are leaving for the city, for jobs, 
for safety. They are taking the old ways with them. They are mixing them with new ways. They are mixing their culture, their bodies. I mixed culture. I, outsider, arrived in the village, mixed my body with one born to the village. Wise women wearing cuspucks spoke to me in dreams, warned me to respect the old ways, to bring the old ways forward, to bring my children, mixed children, forward into the mixed world. The mixed world is finding new ways. The voices of the wise, wise women echo in the new ways to stay the hand, steady the hand, study. The new ways become remembering the old ways. That is my work, to help the remembering. Thank you. Um, so my piece is about a road trip that I took last summer through the Deep South. It was about a thousand miles. Um, and I'm just going to read the last few paragraphs of that piece, and it's called Freedom Come. To reach the National Memorial for Peace and Justice in Montgomery, Alabama, better known as the Lynching Memorial, my mapping system routed me past the first White House of the Confederacy. Secessionists consecrated the house to their unholy cause in 1861, and the city has been known as the cradle of the Confederacy ever since. When writer James Baldwin visited in 1957, locals shared that people still wandered the halls of that house and wept. Nearly 100 years after the fall of the Confederacy, one can only guess what exactly they were mourning. Lovingly preserved by the state of Alabama and the ladies of the first White House Association, the birthplace of the Confederacy represents the finest in Italianate architecture. White, pristine, manicured, with brick red chimneys fortifying its frame. Less than 10 blocks away, the lynching memorial sits at the top of a gentle slope. It is massive, spanning over six acres. Tarnished steel sculptures of black men and women, chained, kneeling, screaming, pleading, Rust running down their naked bodies mark the entrance. Over 800 corroded steel columns representing the counties where lynchings have been documented hang from the structure, much like black bodies hung from trees. Inscribed on each are the names of 4,384 African Americans known to have been murdered in the period between the end of the Civil War and the beginning of the Civil Rights Movement although the full death toll is far greater than that. As I walked between the columns looking for the counties where my family had lived, at times I would reflexively reach out and touch a name, calling them in for just a moment. Near the end, a guide asked me what I thought. Overwhelmed, I answered. Yeah, he said, looking off into the depths of a memorial. It's a lot to take in. Following his gaze through the vast field of stolen lives, I had no words. And so it goes throughout Montgomery, in fact, throughout the South. The Legacy Museum, which charts the unbroken history from African-American enslavement to mass incarceration, stands within Montgomery's former slave market. In Birmingham and Jackson, Confederate monuments are minutes away from sites commemorating the Civil Rights Movement. In Alabama and Mississippi, the legacies of Confederate General Robert E. Lee and Martin Luther King Jr. are celebrated on the same day. Historian Barbara Fields captures the significance of this perpetual contest over memory and meaning succinctly. The Civil War is still going on. It's still to be fought. And regrettably, it could still be lost. From the South to my hometown of San Jose, the 17th century to the 21st, the war rages on. Reporting from the front lines of the 60s, James Baldwin feared that all that was left of the great dream that was to have become America was the illusion of greatness, a narrow narrative used to justify the wanton exercise of power. Illusions rarely go down without a fight, and this one is particularly tenacious, as Trump-supporting crowds chanting, make America great again, attest. 
However, liberation begins with truth-telling, and that truth holds both shadows and light. It is a lynching memorial uncovering the brutality at the heart of the well-trod narrative of the gallant South. It is also the story of ordinary black folks rising up and facing down a centuries-old system of oppression, wielding unarmed truth, a belief in our inescapable connectedness, and faith in the inevitable triumph of justice. These are the stories of the South. These are the stories of the nation, and both need to be told. That which weaves us together transcends time, histories, identities, and geographies. My travels through the South reveal that this holds true whether we know it, honor it, like it, or not. We can flail away in our ignorance and bump up against each other like leaves on the wind, as fate allows. We can give in to the tyranny of our darkest impulses and allow fear to flow freely through our social web, manifesting as chains, bars, and walls to justify delusions of superiority and separation. Or we can embrace the inescapable truth that my liberation is inextricably bound with yours and act with courage and humility to foster a reverence for all life. We can choose. Given the challenges we face as a human community, we must choose. Thank you. Guy Biederman, Dan Brady, Tiny Gray Garcia, Dana Rod, and we'll close with Tango Eisen Martin. Thank you, Shizui. This is an honor. And this is what happens when you corner a poet in a 3 a.m. alley. Whoever said you can't draw with a typewriter never learned to write. Whoever said you can't get news from poetry never went to an open mic. A man face down in the street with bullet holes in his feet is not fit for idle speculation over tea. His home is on the front page of our minds in 1,000 point font. His life screaming in our mouths, sinking in our hearts. The young woman killed while waiting for a train, her skin a target. All the dreams she can't have won't be forgotten if we are of a mind, if we catch, carry, listen and hope and act. 13,000 children held in cages, government issue, state sanctioned kidnapping. Find that key, set them free. I'm becoming a verb before my own eyes. Even little actions lead to big. Even drops of water crack open the rock of old belief. Deaf ears can tune the deeper frequencies. The act of expression is both a possibility and a tool, call it a weapon, if you will. This is what happens when you corner a poet in a 3 a.m. alley and they pull out their pen. <laughs> Imagine poetry as currency. Imagine swapping a story for a bowl of minestrone, a novel for a rack of ribs, haiku for a taco, a limerick for a ripe yellow peach, prose palm for open mind, Flash fiction for sudden truth. Words, they peel back minds, jumpstart hearts, create the flow where poets and listeners share in the fluid economy of understanding and dignity and respect. A free market exchange, if you will, built on the gold standard of love. Brady. Hello. Hello. You may know me as Dan Brady because that's my name. Um, I host an open mic at Sacred Grounds every Wednesday, and, and this handy dandy thing with two sides, which there are many copies of, is a map that I create of the open mics that I know of. And if something's on there that doesn't happen or something's not on there that should be, people let me know. Oh, glasses. Sorry about that. I've rehearsed this. Don't worry. 
So, the, you know, the recent news cycle, right? A while back, they had an election. You remember this, not so long. And on election night, Elizabeth Warren uh, made a statement, and then it was printed out. I saw it on the web, and I got inspired. So this is a mashup between her words and mine, as, as you will soon see. Election night, what Elizabeth Warren could have said. I'd like to tell people still standing in line all across the country, marking ballots, considering their votes, or still waiting to have their voices heard, no matter what happens, I want to thank them for how we work together. It's been a hard fight for the House, the Senate, state houses, and local offices. Because we're, we've been in and are in a fight together. For democracy in a future where everyone has health care and human rights. While Wall Street and faceless corporations are held to account, taken to task and can no longer legally lie, cheat, or steal, nor bend the justice, legislative, or regulatory systems to their wills. We are in a fight for democracy where people no longer die due to debt designed to disable, where children, teens, adults, all people are free of fear when walking down streets, going to malls, to a yoga studio, a church, or synagogue, because they're not being shot, shot at, or hearing shots, because there are no shootings, because we're all pulling together, taking care of one another, building a future inclusive of science with moral obligations to protect both the truth and the earth, and a justice system which no longer grinds up the poor, needy, or people of color, those huddled masses yearning, and we have a government adhering to the rule of law. We are in a fight for our country where seniors live with dignity, social security, enhanced, enlarged, expanded. Women have equal pay for equal right and make decisions about their bodies. We are proud of this new American dream, proud of being immigrants or descendants of same, and know diversity is what has made America great again and again and again. Tonight, we fight for this dream and the dreamers to show ourselves as a nation which keeps mamas and babies together, has a government that is of, by, and for the people, with the Federal Reserve taken in hand, citizens united dumped, and we're bringing home our troops from everywhere to help everyone right here in the homeland. This is the fight, our fight. And we are in it all the way. Every donation, door knock, or phone call you made mattered. Every step you took brought us closer to the better future we are building together. And that is something to be proud of. So no matter what happens, I want you to know serving the public is the greatest honor in life. Having democracies back means that it will have ours. Election day being over does not mean the struggle ends. It was only one day, an important day, but just another day all the same. Keep on keeping on, get up, stand up, fight for what is right, and yes, let's truly remake America great. Thank you. Tiny Gray Garcia, and then Denna Rod, and Tango Eisen Martin. Are you guys here? Okay, great. Anti-social workers and case manglers call me crazy, lazy, dumb, and a bum, because my knowledge don't come from the institution. Yeah, I'm a poverty scholar, that houseless mama, that houseless daughter. All the people you don't want to see, never want to be, look away from me. What you gonna do, arrest me? We're in your city. So uh, I want to shout out to my fellow poverty scholars in the audience, although I feel like there's a lot of them in this beautiful book. Can I get a witness? Um, but Leroy Moore, D. Allen, Queen Nandi Ekshba, and many more who have been part of the beautiful work of She Was Away. Thank you. Um, thank you for giving access to people like me. I got a sixth grade public school institution education, uh, but I have a PhD in poverty. And Shizue actually published two of my pieces, which there's nowhere I have the time to read. 
but I do need to let you guys know, first of all, what's a poverty scholar? The notion of poverty scholarship was born in the calles, the prisons, the street corners, the community centers, welfare offices, shelters, kitchen tables, assembly lines, tenements, favelas, projects, and ghettos. Poverty scholars are everywhere. We are your mama, your corner store liquor store owner, your street corner gardener, and your recycler. So if you want to read the full uh, definition of what a poverty scholar is, check it out in this beautiful book. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close with a little bit, a little excerpt of the other piece I did uh, that I like affectionately like to call conservator shit. So if people don't know what's happening in this stolen, occupied uh, village of Yalamu, AKA San Francisco gentrification city, um, let me give you a little hint into the world that I live in. Me and Ma were houseless for um, most of my childhood. So I don't say these things uh, as an advocate. I say them as someone who's lived through this. Um, but in this very city, when we talk about cages, they are incarcerating every poor person they get under a new, yet another lie, or excuse me, law. Um, and so this is just a little excerpt. Conserved, you heard? That's colonizer code for you lost all your rights as a houseless disabled person on this stolen mama earth. Conservatorship, a con from the get. Anti-social workers lined up to get paid by that ish. Yeah, I'm mad. Because we got lies, I mean laws, upon laws to incarcerate every poor person they get because the war on the poor is in full effect. From sleeping bans to you don't get to be poor and sit or stand. From Alameda to Ladera Heights, we have elders and children being evicted overnight. Please listen in, because this shit ain't right. Thank you, everybody. Please learn about it. And, uh, in St. Petersburg, Florida, they're building cages for houseless people, just like our indigenous brown babies crossing these false borders. Learn about it. Dinner, Rod, and then Tango, Ison, Martin. Find your bubble. As a child taught to fill bubbles when it came to standardized testing, one bubble over all others gave me pause. My date of birth and name were easy, yet when it came to choosing race, I froze. I was certain that Iranian was something my parents made up. After all, we had no internet to check facts, and since I barely knew anyone at my elementary school who was Iranian, I figured my parents were lying to me about where we were really from. The world globe in our home exacerbated my suspicion of my parents perpetuating a long con of where we were really from. At the time of the globe's manufacturing, North and South Rhodesia and the USSR were still nations. Therefore, Iran was labeled as Persia. Due to my ignorance of this historical context, I despaired when I couldn't find the Iran my parents told me existed. There was no bubble on my standardized test to fill in encompassing all of these things. The nuanced categories of today on the US Census weren't available. Forced to make a decision, I marked myself down as Asian based on my very exhaustive research on our home globe. Iran was in Asia, therefore, based on these limited racial categories, I was Asian. After all, I wasn't white. Yet I wasn't satisfied with marking down Asian and I worried I would get in trouble like seven-year-olds do. Especially since star testing was considered the end-all be-all of tests. And I raised my hand and I asked my second grade teacher, what bubble do I fill? Her puzzled face gently corrected me and she informed me that Asian meant someone who was Chinese or Japanese. She gave me examples using my classmates. Despite my confusion and her lack of linguistic nuance, I erased the bubble marking me as Asian and filled in the one for white. Filling in that bubble for white is based on the current US census definition for white. 
as a person having origins in any of the original peoples of Europe, the Middle East, or North Africa. We were all effectively counted as white, despite the fact that we were brown in any other context. The cops pulling my father over with his thick black mustache over his full lips and strong connected eyebrows didn't consider him white when they heard his accent. And my mother abbreviating her name to DJ so it would fit on a Target name tag wasn't considered white. And none of the kids on the playground thought I was white either. And this was further complicated as I grew up, as the attacks on the Twin Towers occurred. I sharply learned that I wasn't white. I didn't suffer at the hands of my classmates who tortured those who were visibly Islamic looking, who had more foreign sounding names, but my generic sounding name meant I have another form of white passing privilege. My name doesn't clock me as other. Thank you, my name is Zenarad. Tango Eisen Martin. If you reverse the car any farther, you will run over all the scenes in the back of your mind. Yeah, I never cared for teachers, just the patterns of their fainting spells, fainting spells induced by wall art, all that to say propaganda is courage. The price sticker hides my tattoo. I treasure my problem with the world. My mother becomes from Brooklyn first thing in the morning. That's a proverb around these parts, proverb, a peasant entrance password. Writing short notes to famous Europeans on the back of postcards with ransom requests. They reply with a newsreel or cigarette announcement. I can't tell the difference. Noble dollars, then you die inside, but only inside. They call it sleeping deeper than your stalker. And a stalker is all that badge makes you. It says a great spirit dressed in the bloody rags tuxedos became. Meanwhile, my punch is feared by no one. Proud of yourself, I ask my fret hand. Porch lights is what they call our guns. I've seen this house in a dream. I believe a trumpet was the first possessed object to fly. I keep going, she cheers. The draft in the room becomes a toddler. Toddler obsessed with an altar. The altar becomes a runaway train. I got a thousand paintings like these cascading down my skinny arms. Dictionaries piled up to the window bars. A reminder to the population that your blanket can work with or against you. Human reef. We will be a big human reef of concepts that finally gain a metaphysical nature and they will swim around our beautiful poses. We stop being flashbacks, then stop being three different people. Then I was alone the pistol one city away. And one of the drug triangles lines runs through my head. I tap the bottle twice and consider the dead refreshed. They don't you wanna rest your bravery? Don't you wanna be a coward for a little bit? Back and forth to a panic attack with no problems nor fears, a man gets a facial expression finally, a Friday finally goes his way. His life is finally talked about happily in his head. Hey man, I can't possess the body of a hermit. I must be the last of his smoke now running the other way with three blocks of alley tucked under my arms. You ever see a man get to the bottom of his soul in a car ride down a missing cousin street, half step to the right? I mean, I took the whole car outside of history. Half step to the right, I mean a whole pack of wolves stepped to my left. Road marker is what I call the light bulb we had for a son. A whole civilization might slink to the sink or a chain gang shuffling next to a sucker, also known as the long look in the mirror. Stack of money starts talking from four cities away. Thank you. So thank you again to the San Francisco Public Library for hosting us. the Zellerbach Family Foundation and all the donations and the volunteer energy. I printed 300 of these books. I wanna get them in every bookstore and every public school and library in the Bay Area. They need to be out there. I need your help organizing readings, getting, <laughs> getting the books into your local libraries uh, and, uh, and schools and uh, I want to thank you all. I mean, this is only a third of the people in the book, and you can see what remarkable people we have in this town. It's not just about words. It's about deeds, 
and you know, I'm sorry I, people didn't have the time to tell you all the things that they do, all the remarkable things like Kevin and, and uh, uh, Dan and Richard Sandrell who didn't even get a chance to read. I mean, all I can say is I, you know, I gave up six months out of my life to pull this off. I'm going, why am I doing this? This is crazy. I can't help doing it. It's because of you. It's because of us. It's a, because of all the apathetic people out there who know that things are wrong. They're bored shitless. They don't know what to do. Don't give up on those people. Let's not just talk to the converted. There are people out there that need our hope, that need our knowledge, that need our savvy. So let's get out there and do it. And stick around for the reception, stick around for the group photo, because as I say, I'm just learning the ropes on this funding stuff. I hate money. I was raised not to make money. It's like, give it away. But you know, I need money to get these things done, to hire help, et cetera, et cetera. So stay for the picture so I can impress the funders. <laughs> stay for the food and the Latino room. We have lots of food. People hauled Amaika on the BART for you guys to enjoy. So <laughs> take care. Thanks, everybody. What? Uh, yeah. Please gather by the stairs out here. Leon's son is going to take a group portrait. Even if you didn't read tonight, if you're a contributor, get your book and hold it in front of you, and let's make a really impressive group portrait. Oh, thank you. All right, was it on? Yeah, it was. Fuck. <laughs>